That's the problem with putting me in charge. Uh, welcome, everyone, and good morning. My name's Nate Fick. I'm the US Ambassador for Cyberspace and Digital Policy. And it's a thrill to be here this morning with our class of global emerging leaders in international cyberspace security, JELIX for short. I had the great privilege of being with this group at the beginning of their fellowship year at the RSA conference in San Francisco. And we pledged then uh, that we would be together again here in Kyoto at the Internet Governance Forum. And it's such a pleasure to see it all actually come together that way. Uh, we just had the, uh, a bit of a graduation ceremony for the fellows in the other room a few minutes ago. They are diplomats and government experts from 20 countries, uh, almost literally every corner of the world. And what they have in common is a commitment uh, to the importance of technology issues and cybersecurity and foreign policy, uh, and understanding that these issues are becoming more important and more central. And I think a visceral appreciation that this is, in fact, a team sport, and none of us can do it alone. I am pleased, honored, to be sitting between uh, two of my colleagues who help ensure every day that I don't have to do this alone. Uh, uh, representing our host government uh, here in Japan. To my left is Ambassador Ishizuki Hideo. Uh, Ishizuki-san is Ambassador for International Security and Cyber Policy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. And uh, a wonderful colleague, one of the pioneers in technology diplomacy, uh, and someone who welcomed me to the fold uh, when I was appointed to this role a year ago. And to my right is Ambassador Regina Greenberger, Ambassador for Cyber Foreign Policy and Cybersecurity in the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Also a pioneer, uh, someone who has been uh, at work mainstreaming technology diplomacy uh, around the world and, and another uh, in this community who welcomed me uh, to the fold when I took the job. The title of this session is Building Diplomatic Networks for a Safe, Secure Cyberspace. And uh, it drives home, I think, the point that success in these areas is really about people, process, and technology in that order. We often want to default right to the technical answer, uh, but nor, I think, as you said at the beginning of our session uh, a little while ago, uh, we can't forget the human element. And in fact, the human element uh, matters more than the others. So this gathering was intended to build connections in order to strengthen our diplomatic networks uh, in the service of a safe, secure cyberspace, and to create champions, really, for the power of the framework for responsible state behavior in cyberspace, uh, and to create global networks of people who, when the proverbial bad thing happens, can pick up the telephone at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, and have a trusted counterpart on the other, other end of the line uh, who can help them solve a problem. So in the discussion this morning, uh, we are going to hear from several of the fellows. Uh, we will hear from uh, the ambassadors to my left and right. We'll turn this into a conversation around the table. And uh, I just want to say at the outset again, thank you all for committing your time and energy to this fellowship over the past year. Uh, and this really is only the beginning. We look forward to working with you for years and hopefully decades to come. So, uh, having said all of that, um, our, our first question is for uh, Siraprapa of Thailand, who is sitting, I, there we go. Uh, so, I would love to hear just quickly insights that you gleaned from the program, and three or four that matter most to you um, as a diplomat engaged in these issues around the world. So thank you, Ambassador Dionis, to meet you again, Ambassador Fick, and also Ambassador Hideo Ishizuki and Ambassador Eugene um, Greenberger. So I'm Sira Papa from the National Security Council of Thailand. I'm here with a very di diverse cohort, and in my group, to be honest, we discussed this question prior to, to today's session because we need a more inclusive um, answer. So uh, we have here 
a representative from Dominican Republic, Estonia, and Poland, and also Indonesia in my group. The first point, the, f the first point that we gleaned from the program is especially the emerging technology and AI. So for us, diplomat and policy maker, we feel that um, it is so challenging that we need to be more agile in adapting the policy and also the legal framework of our country to handle this situation of the innovation. The second one is maybe uh, the most cliche word that you hear along the IGF is about the public-private partnership or the multi-stakeholder. So the cooperation with the private sector help bridging the gap between um, us about the technical expertise and also the technological resources, but not only us gaining from the private sector, the private sector also got a chance, the opportunity to be in the session and help us implement the right policy for them as well. And the last point is about the relationship between geopolitics and cybersecurity. So we, it's undeniable that cybersecurity, cyber threat is a transnational issue. So uh, one single nation cannot handle this kind of threat alone. So we need the cooperation, the international cooperation. So in a nutshell, it is cliche that you may hear the word multilateralism, multi-stakeholderism, but it is the must that we need to go to that direction. So if you are, do you want to move on to the next cliche? So let's do it right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Maritza. And uh, this is fairly straightforward. In what practical, concrete ways do you think this network uh, will be useful in your work? Um, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, distinguished ambassadors. Uh, I'm Marisa Ristovska from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of North Macedonia. Uh, I will speak on behalf of my colleague from uh, Georgia, uh, Dominican Republic, and Jamaica. Uh, we believe that uh, the prof this network uh, is a valuable asset in the complex and rapidly evolving landscape of cyber secu cyberspace security. Our network is composed of dedicated diplomats and experts from all around the world who should play a very important role in advancing international cooperation, fostering understanding, building, building trust, and strengthening resilience to the wide spectrum of cyber threats. Uh, our network could be affected in several key ways. It can facilitate and enhance cooperation both multilaterally and bilaterally with an international organization, such as UN. For example, we, we already have experience uh, within the OEWG uh, on ICT and the UN Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime. It can also facilitate and enhance cooperation both multilaterally and bilaterally within the framework of regional organization uh, initiatives and platforms. Uh, for example, we already have a, uh, a cooperation with an OEC, European OEC, and the American region, OS 60. Furthermore, it can serve as a platform for uh, the exchange of policy ideas and approaches to cybersecurity issues, uh, both at international and national levels. Um, it could serve as a platform for timely sharing of information insights and best practices related to cyber threats and vulnerabilities. Uh, in case of massive cyber attacks against one of our countries, the network can enable swift communication and coordination among our nations to effectively address a large-scale cyber attacks against a single state. A coordinated and multifaceted international approach is of immense, immense importance in order to ensure accountability and provide information and technical forensic evidence to facilitate, uh, uh, in order to facilitate the attribution. Uh, in this context, our network can serve as a hub for coordination during and after cyber incident. In conclusion, I would say that uh, JALEX network will improve the understanding among countries so we can advance responsible state beha behavior in cyber to ensure the world is a safer place to facilitate and national development goals. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Yeah, next question is for Sharif. And I think uh, we've said that all of us who are technology or cyber diplomats to some extent are bridges, uh, bridges between 
our mainstream ministries and the technical community. And there's a, uh, a saying that bridges get walked on. Uh, so, what, Sharif, what's your recommendation to avoid the technology and policy conversations being separate? How do you bridge these communities? Thank you. Uh, she just talked about collaboration, partnership. We've been hearing that almost uh, throughout the conference today, and you know, through discussions coming out of uh, the that came out from UNGG, the OEWG, CRI, it has been collaboration, 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 and, and our experiences also. Like so, to to keep these discussions, uh, you know, like together instead of separate, we feel. Uh, like, for example, from the Philippines, they, they, they used to do some uh, cross-functional team building. Uh, they do meetings that bring these people together to have these discussions. And we also think uh, there should be specific agencies that, that are responsible for, for keeping people together. Like uh, in Nigeria, for example, we are just setting up the National Cybersecurity Coordination Center. There's the uh, National Agency for Cybersecurity in Albania. Uh, National, uh, uh, what's it called again? Uh, so the uh, national 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 authority for cybersecurity. Yeah, national authority for cybersecurity in Albania. That 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 this team this it hold you so I can hold someone responsible mm -hmm. for those discussions. And like the national authority for cybersecurity in Albania, for example, they are also working on a communication protocol to help delineate these responsibilities and to like to have a collective uh, front when when having this discussion uh, this uh, discussions. And one last thing I'd like to also say like uh, that. Discussions to taking these discussions outside the shores of our countries, uh, programs like Jelix, like the one we are in, can really help bring people together and like build the collective knowledge of uh, understanding the interplay between the two uh, responsibilities, uh, the two groups rather. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharif. And I think another uh, another reality in this work is that each of our countries is at a different stage of maturity in dealing with cybersecurity issues. Uh, and nonetheless, there are commonalities uh, that cut across every level of the capacity building spectrum. So Pablo, uh, what are some of these commonalities that you and colleagues face when, uh, when it comes to promoting international cyberspace security? Thank you, Ambassador, for the question. Also, thanks to Ambassador Nishizuki, Ambassador Greenberger, met you before. And well, so my, I'm going to speak on behalf of the, my lovely group uh, from Ecuador, uh, Malaysia, South Africa, acquired the virus group, by the way. And I have to agree again with Nora said that people actually who makes a difference, you know, in the process, you know, to promote in cybersecurity, and especially you're on the governor, no matter if you're in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other agencies. Maybe I want to highlight, I mean, three elements. The first one is probably m maybe one of the most important ones. How you make some I mean, cybersecurity a top priority for your governments or different administration, you know, because our country, our state has to face and deal with different threats, you know. They are very complex, urgent sometimes, and sometimes cybersecurity probably is not the top priority. And you have to um, do a lot, I mean, to, in terms to convince your own authorities, you know, other agencies that this is important, you know. And as my an, an older boss sometimes used to tell me, Pablo, means urgent things come first and important things. But uh, in trying to make this as something urgent, important, permanently, is a daily, you know, um, effort, you know. And sometimes it's frustrated, sometimes it's pretty exciting, but it's something you must do, uh, definitely. The second point I would say is something which is quite important in terms of cybersecurity today. We were discussing a lot during this fora is about the uh, capacity of buildings, you know. Has to really has to work a lot in terms to how you create your expertise as a national levels, get training, you know, our financial assistance. This is something that I would say all the state, but especially I mean in my group, I mean this is something quite critical, and I would say it's strategic important because with no capacity building, there's no way to face the problem right you have right now in cyberspace, and that is also permanent tax. It's very important, and that means resources, which is not. not I mean, too many resources I mean, we can get. So that's also very important to highlight. And last one is uh, something that this is this um, all about. I mean, in this uh, photo, it's about the uh, your work and your partnership with stakeholders. You know, 
Uh, this is something that, of course, we, uh, I mean, we're trying, I mean, to do more, you know, but uh, in terms of your work with the private sector, the academia, uh, civil society, you know, it's trying to also to understand and to make everyone can understand that those stakeholders are really important and relevant to include in your own process, you know, because sometimes governments say, well, this is just a government issue, you know, we need to, I mean, to engage, all the people. but uh, you have to tell they are important, not just at the national level, but also at the international discussion area. So I would say these three elements is something we have as a permanent task uh, we got in our group. Thank you. Thank you. My last question for the fellows before we turn to uh, the ambassadors is for Samia. And this is an annual program, although this is the first class. What advice do you have for those who will come behind you uh, about how to get the most out of it? Thank you very much, Excellency, and good morning to you all. Um, I am speaking in behalf of my very wonderful colleagues from Panama, Jordan, and from Costa Rica, <coughs> and I'm from Bangladesh. Um, <coughs> We are very proud to be the first cohort because we have um, uh, we have all sorts of things that we have learned new. So we believe that our advice to the future cohorts would, as mentors, would be very effective. In this journey, it would be uh, vital to have a very comprehensive understanding uh, <coughs> of their own countries cyber landscape, including the various agencies or entities uh, are involved um, with their unique roles in the global context. Uh, in that line, multi-stakeholderism uh, multi comes in because it's so essential in this venture and we believe that the foreign ministries uh, will play a very important collaborative role uh, uh, to bridge between the public and the private entities. Next, um, because uh, uh, we are grateful that this program has been uh, arranged by the U.S. State Department, which gives us actually, it has given us uh, the way to look into the U.S. cyberspace, which um, uh, how you have dealt with uh, this uh, cyber diplomacy and uh, how uh, the country, United States, has um, uh, evolutionized um, um, uh, their venture into this space. And uh, this will give the future cohorts also an insight into this and um, uh, the various stakeholders and counterparts. Uh, this interaction will enhance their ability to understand their own uh, ecosystem. So we would uh, encourage them to further do so. And um, all this, summarizing all this, it brings us uh, the past cohorts, which is us now, and the future cohorts very closure uh, to achieving what we had actually set out to achieve in the first place when we began in May, and when, if I may quote uh, our ambassador, um, this, is, uh, this will be an opportunity to turn to a friend, an ally, or a fellow um, when we are having a bad day or a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and now, for Ambassador Ishizuki, uh, your government's commitment to international leadership on cybersecurity and technology, technology issues is clear. Uh, it's demonstrated by hosting 9,000 attendees uh, in person and virtually at this IGF. How is Japan organized around cybersecurity at the government level, and what's changing as the MFA now continues to elevate these topics in Japan's foreign policy. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm quite honored to be here uh, uh, to participate this this forum. And uh, first of all, on behalf of the uh, officials of the host country, uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you uh, who are here today. And uh, uh, maybe on, I think there is also someone who is attending online. I, th I think. And uh, for those who are lucky to be here uh, in Kyoto, uh, please enjoy the rest of your stay in Kyoto. And I'm Hideo Ishizuki, ambassador in charge of cyber policy, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, I have taken up this position uh, as cyber ambassador uh, last October. Uh, so, uh, so it's been uh, uh, exactly one year since I took up this position, and 
And I must confess, uh, this is totally a new area uh, for me during my 30 years of diplomatic career. And uh, what I learned from my one-year struggle uh, is the value of a human network uh, across, the, across the board. And I really, in that sense, I really appreciate the personal relationship uh, with Ambassador Fick and Ambassador Greenberger, uh, both of whom I met uh, for the first time in Singapore uh, exactly one year ago at the Singapore uh, Cyber International Cyber Week. And I believe that human network uh, fostered by through this fellowship will be a good foundation uh, for to advance international cooperation. And uh, now let me turn to uh, turn on to you, uh, your question: uh, How Japan is organized around cybersecurity at the government level? Uh, in Japan, uh, we are facing increasing threats of malicious cyber operations, uh, include, including those of ransomware and those against critical infrastructure uh, like hospitals. And uh, the reported cases of ransomware incident has increased by 58% uh, from 2021 to 2022. So it's a huge increase. And to respond to these increasing threats, Japan is strengthening its cybersecurity organizations. Uh, in April 2022, our National Police Agency established the Cyber Affairs Bureau and National Cyber Unit with 2,700 uh, fully engaged personnel. The also, the Ministry of Defense uh, aims to increase the number of self-defense force personnel in cyber specialized units uh, from the current 890 to 4,000 uh, by fiscal year 2027. So this is a very ambitious plan, uh, I, and, uh, but uh, we are trying to achieve that goal. And in addition, uh, we are currently working on the challenges uh, tasked by our national security strategy, uh, which was issued in December last year, uh, in order to strengthen the response capability in the cyber in the field of cybersecurity. And uh, these challenges include, as uh, somebody has already mentioned, to enhance public and private collaboration, which is a big challenge. And also, uh, we are uh, now trying, uh, exploring the way to introduce active cyber defense uh, for eliminating in advance the possibility of serious cyber attacks. Uh, and also, uh, there is also a need to reform the government structure. Uh, we need to set up a new organization uh, which will coordinate cyber security policies in a centralized manner, uh, allowing us to take more effective whole of government uh, approach across sectors. So these are the challenges we, we face. And as for Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the national, national security stra strategy has given us a task uh, of enhancing international cooperation uh, to informa for information gathering and analysis and attribution and the public announcement, uh, as well as the formulation of international frameworks and rules uh, including those at the UN for responsible state, uh, responsible state behavior in cyber cyberspace. So uh, in Japan, threats in cyberspace has become to be viewed as more related to international security uh, rather than, yeah, it, it, traditionally it's been the uh, area of the law enforcement agencies, but now it has become more important to military, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And this is because, uh, as somebody has already mentioned, uh, increasing geopolitical competition, uh, such as Russia's war on Ukraine, uh, together with increased threats of disinformation campaign, as well as increased risk by cyber attacks against critical infrastructure. Uh, and I must confess uh, that the, maybe the biggest challenge uh, our ministry, what we face, is short of staff mm. uh, in the ministry. And policy challenges we need to address in cyberspace and the importance of diplomacy in this area never stop increasing. We need more staff uh, to handle these in, uh, increasing tasks. Uh, I think this, is a, this may be a common challenge, uh, as Pablo has already said, that uh, this is a commonality side we face, I think. Uh, all the Ministry of Foreign Affairs all over the world may face this kind of you know, uh, situation. And uh, I think this is where the value of this fellowship lies, 
uh, this would be a very important uh, endeavor to, you know, uh, to, to sort of you know, improve the level of diplomats in the in the cyberspace. And uh, I think yeah, that's where the value of this, you know, fellowship is. And with that, I conclude my remark. Thank you very much. Yoshizuki san thank you for that and sharing your insight. So, Ambassador Greenberger, you're a career diplomat with a background in economics and financial issues and agricultural issues. How do you bring that experience to bear now, negotiating and discussing cyber policy topics? Uh, thank you, Nate, for that <coughs> question. Um, where could I start? I think cyber diplomacy as such uh, is of a cross-cutting nature. So you don't only deal with uh, you know, one particular field of uh, experience or expertise within the foreign ministry, but you have to connect several dots that lie mostly in different departments, not only within the ministry, but also within the government. And Ambassador Ishizuki mentioned this already. This is, uh, you know, the the joint approach of a government uh, to, to tackle these challenges by cybersecurity has to be has to be strengthened. And my personal background helps me because I <laughs> I'm not specialized in any of the fields. So I'm I have a general approach by my own training. Then the second element that is um, important uh, to understand uh, and it was also mentioned, but I would like to highlight it again and stress it a little bit more, is that we are basically speaking about a security policy portfolio, uh, which means that um, there is a role for foreign ministries. It's, uh, it's not only for uh, agencies, homeland affairs, military. It is, um, it is really a foreign and security policy issue. And uh, so a career diplomat like myself who has wandered through different uh, bureaus and has uh, served at different assignments uh, sees also the commonalities of this particular field of security policy with others. So um, this, I would say, is another um, uh, element that from my personal background helps me to, to deal with it with the portfolio that I have now. And um, then, of course, cyber diplomacy is also, also the internet is not new. Cyber diplomacy is quite a new avant-garde topic, I would say, in many of the ministries and is not uh, very well structured, even in our case, where uh, we established the first unit for cyber diplomacy in 2011. So, um, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago, and still uh, we have to fight for, um, you know, the awareness that uh, uh, Pablo also mentioned, the awareness at the highest level of leadership in our ministry. And what is, what is necessary to do this is this entrepreneurial spirit that you perhaps also, you know, you can share, you can relate to that. Uh, this the spirit that means you have a new you have a product that is interesting for other people and you try to sell it to them um, and then uh, perhaps also uh, something that is important to have uh, confidence as a you know as a diplomat who has different experiences but has no cyber experience I mean this is uh, basically about diplomacy so we are diplomats we use the diplomacy toolbox. Uh, we don't fix the computers of our colleagues. <laughs> um, we, you might help them when the printer is uh, out of order, but basically we are diplomats. So the diplomatic toolbox is valid also here. Ambassador Ishizuki mentioned the multilateral negotiations. I mean, this is tradecraft uh, at its best, so we have to deal with um, uh, the same, you know, uh, terms of reference as, as in other fields. And you mentioned it, uh, that my last point, it's team sport. So uh, you might not be an IT expert yourself, but you have to work with IT experts. And that is something that I have learned during my all, my, all of my career, that I always have to turn to colleagues who know it better than myself. And then my role is to bring all these arguments and perspectives to the table. Thank you for that uh, really 
wonderful synopsis. I think that really ought to help drive home the point for all of us that, um, uh, that our colleagues who may not have as much exposure to these topics as we collectively now do uh, need not be intimidated, right? There is, uh, there's a role here for diplomats uh, with diplomatic skills, and we need to apply those skills in this new and emerging domain of diplomacy. So with that, I think we have time for discussion. Uh, my colleague, Catherine Fittrell, will moderate any questions that come in from online viewers. Uh, but this is an opportunity for audience questions or comments. It's an opportunity for the fellows to weigh in with more thoughts or questions, and of course, my colleagues. Yes. Let's, uh, can we pass the mic only because otherwise it may be very hard to hear online. Thank you. Hi, Ambassador Fick, Ambassador Hisuzuki, and Ambassador Greenberger. Um, the other keyword that we learned in the different panels was the gaps between the Global North and the Global South. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only multi-stakeholderism, but also the, this gap existing between both regions in the world. Uh, in terms of international cooperation, uh, what is your best advice at digital ambassadors for developing nations in terms of capacity building and digital literacy? Happy to give my colleagues uh, the first crack at that. Please, okay. please. Um, so um, the first uh, thing that is uh, to be done is to acknowledge the relevance of cyber security for national security. So that might be the case if you have a national security strategy or a cyber security strategy whatever, from which whichever angle you approach it, in the end it has to be clear, okay, this is a national security issue. And somebody said it from you, it's also not a national, it's actually an international security issue. So uh, there should be some, you know, um, some reflex in a foreign ministry to claim ownership for this topic. Uh, this is a leadership decision. Um, then the next one is, of course, uh, literacy, as you said, is important. Um, but literacy can be acquired by, uh, by on different paths pathways. So um, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, opportunities, uh, for example, online learning tools and so on. Uh, you, it doesn't necessarily have to start with, you know, you don't have to start with a cyber diplomat. You can become a cyber diplomat mm -hmm. on the job. So that would perhaps be my two advices. Maybe um, I'm speaking from a, a bit of dip, di bit different you know, perspective that uh, uh, in order to build up the uh, capacity uh, in this area, maybe uh, we are thinking that the uh, regional uh, mechanism or regional effort might be might be uh, valuable, might be effective, and uh, as such that uh, uh, with ASEAN countries we've been working on the uh, our sort of capacity building support, and uh, we have set up a, a center in Bangkok uh, which is called AJCCB AJCCBC. ASEAN Japan Capacity Building Center in Bangkok. And uh, uh, it was set up uh, It was set up five years ago. And uh, during these five years, we have uh, given the uh, training program through this uh, AJCCBC. Uh, more than, uh, more than 1,000 uh, 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 people uh, from the ASEAN member state. So these kind of you know, regional efforts might, might be uh, kind of you know, might be useful to to level up the, uh, uh, the the capacity of the, uh, uh, of, the, of, the of the of of each state, and uh, also uh, just just a bit of advertisement that uh, there is also the World Bank is working on the capacity building support, and uh, uh, they have recently uh, set up a, a fund uh, called the Multi Donor uh, Capacity Building Trust Fund, uh, no Multi Donor Cyber Security Trust Fund. And uh, this is a kind of, you know, worldwide effort uh, conducted by the uh, kind of, you know, uh, World Bank. 
And uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this, this kind of you know, multilateral framework efforts is also useful to level up the uh, capacity building of each country. Thank you. If I, I can just add a, uh, my perspective on this. Uh, it's easy as a, as a cyber tech diplomat um, to spend all of your time and energy focused on um, the most sophisticated aspects of this work and all of the advantages that these emerging uh, technologies can bring to our societies. But we need to never forget that there are still 2.8 billion people, 2.7 or 2.8 billion people on this planet who are not connected. Uh, and without basic connectivity, uh, they will have little or no opportunity to participate in all of the advantages that we spend our, our time and energy on. So priority number one in, in many regards, in my view, is uh, focusing on that basic connectivity. Um, a second observation is that capacity building actually applies to all of us. Uh, it's, it's not just a matter of uh, some more developed nations building capacity uh, in some that are less developed in these areas. Uh, a key challenge for us at the State Department is building capacity inside our own organization um, where, uh, where we don't have nearly the, the skill base that we need in order to meet the challenges in the world in these areas. And one of the, that can sometimes seem like a daunting challenge uh, but there's very little need to reinvent the wheel. We can take what we've done or what we've learned, we can take what anyone has done or learned uh, and try to share it or repurpose it for others in order to accelerate their path up that maturity curve. So um, we try to, try to keep both of these uh, aspects in mind when we're, when we're uh, building or negotiating or discussing uh, policies across the full spectrum of technology issues. If I may. Oh. Okay, I'll need, I'll need someone with eyes behind me to uh, We've got, well, we've to got, the, uh, we've got the video as well. So uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Christopher Tate with Connect Free and Internet 3. I'd like to apologize first on behalf of all IT experts for making your jobs harder as diplomats. Um, it wasn't our uh, really kind of idea to make the internet a hard thing to do, but there is hope. And there's hope in the, in the sense that um, the United States has um, really brought a lot of new standards online um, called zero trust. And what that means is that we can re-architect the way that the internet uh, works in order to um, really bring security into the heart of the internet. And so um, there's a lot of really hard people, uh, really hard work going on to make sure that the internet can be a new um, not, we'll keep the, keep the existing infrastructure in place, but also extend it to a lot of places. Um, we here at uh, uh, IGF have, or at Connect Free here at IGF, have um, announced kind of a, a new way of thinking about the internet where everyone can own their own IP address and it's based off a public-private key pair. So that means that everyone can um, essentially generate their own IPv6 address and therefore um, extend into these regions where um, there's really hard to, hard, it's really hard to bring in these network operation centers and other infrastructure. So uh, I really appreciate your delegation here and your uh, time and consideration. And um, I really think that you know, there's a lot of um, uh, diplomatic side and also there's a lot of things that we can do on the technical side and bringing, bridging the gap as it were to uh, connect these two uh, technical and diplomatic things. So thank you for your attention and time. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Ambassador Isuzuki, Ambassador Greenberger, and of course, Ambassador Fick. I have a question directed to Ambassador Fick. So I have read somewhere that a certain Marine in the early 2000s stated that good commanders act and create opportunities. Great commanders ruthlessly exploit those opportunities. So in order for these fellows, for us, to be great leaders, as a person who rose from the ranks of leadership in many forms, how would you advise us to go about in our post jelix journey in affecting the necessary changes and updates in policy in our respective ministries and governments to reflect the lessons we have learned from this great program, this great opportunity provided by the USDOS and Meridian? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and I appreciate the researcher reading that may have gone into that question. <laughs> um, 
Look, a, a couple a couple observations here. Um, I I am new to this government bureaucracy, um, and and still maybe a little more than a year in have the benefit of fresh eyes. Uh, so a, a couple things that I would I would urge you to remember as you go back fully into your your roles on the other side of this fellowship are um, first. Um, assume good intentions on the part of your colleagues. Uh, back to our last discussion, there's uneven understanding of these issues. Uh, there are many different factors and considerations, many different values to weigh. Um, we are going to have different points of view about what matters most, how to rack and stack those priorities, but I think most people working on these issues generally share a similar desire uh, to, uh, uh, to connect people, to, to bring the benefits of technology to people, to, to mitigate the, the harms, um, and to, to try to make the world a better place. So first is assume good intentions. Um, I think at a, at a very personal level, um, the, the next thing that I would urge is um, it's, it's very helpful to have the ability to walk away. Um, and uh, sometimes in our system, people talk about that in financial terms. That's not what I mean. I mean psychologically or emotionally. Um, don't fall so in love with your position uh, that you can't consider other points of view. And um, I think that's actually quite hard to do. Um, the uh, uh, one of my favorite authors, F. Scott Fitzgerald, said, uh, wrote at one point that the, the mark of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in mind at the same time. And I think with these issues, you have to be able to do that. And you have to be able to walk away from an idea that, that maybe you're deeply invested in um, because these are complicated things and they change. Yes. Still working? Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'm Gorin Wodla from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia, currently uh, posted to Geneva. It's been really a nice journey with these people all around the table, and I think the human component indeed is uh, the most important thing about that. Um, I would maybe continue with Ambassador Fick just said about having always those two sides or positions in mind because I feel very often when we talk about cybersecurity issues we, we focus on the, um, the security perspective, the threats that come from it, but we shall not forget that technologies as such bring us a lot of opportunities as well as when we train people we need to train them to also look at the digital perspective because I feel there's a lot of sort of confusion around semantics or definitions of what is a cyber diplomacy, what is a digital diplomacy, and how they actually connect to each other. And it was very interesting to hear an um, ambassador from Japan saying that there's a need to increase the, um, the, the amount of people, because we have big countries behind the table with a very big administration, as I come from a country where the amount of diplomats is around 400, 500, and we have to tackle those sort of global issues all the time, right? So I would just I think it's more of a comment than a question that we need to really emphasize the, the, the capacities or the, um, the knowledge of people to understand that digital and cyber issues both are part sort of the um, global policy sort of questions, not as a um, domain or a field on its own. Thank you very much. Karen, thank you. Can I respond to your comment, though, and, and just point out that uh, Estonia may have four or 500 diplomats total, but Estonia is small but mighty, uh, especially in these areas. And that's actually a, a generalizable comment, I think. One of the great benefits of these technologies is that uh, the, the capital expenditure required to develop them is, is pretty low. The scale benefits that they uh, bring with them are, are pretty high. And so there's a, a bit of a decoupling between um, traditional measures of national influence um, and, and abil the ability to influence 
um, the world on these topics. Estonia is a perfect example. A, a very bad thing happened in Estonia, and uh, in the wake of that bad thing, because of national leadership and investment and focus, um, you developed this kind of world-defining expertise in this area that is incredibly uh, inspiring, I think, to everyone around this table. And I think that's a huge success story. Um, it's, it's a repeatable success story in other places with focus and discipline and investment. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew, I'm from Jamaica. Um, a question I have for um, ambassadors. Coming from an island state, very small, um, there are different priorities that compete with each other all the time. This particular issue intersects with all issues of development. It's a developmental issue, I see it as well, because the harms that exist online, they sometimes undermine what is done back home in terms of different areas. What would be your advice for, for countries who this issue may not be at a high level, and how would you, as what would be your recommendations to help us go back to our different countries and to convince, to persuade um, different leaders of government and at different levels to put this issue at the focus which it needs to be, given that a lot of things compete, and with a small country, you have to decide what's the net benefit of pursuing X or pursuing Y. So what would be, let's say, your top three um, recommendations that would help an individual to go back home to persuade um, the movers and shakers who, who, need, who we need to approve these things? Thank you. Thank you. I, it's on. Okay, uh, I give the first, uh, and you do the other two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my my point would be um, sometimes digital is the door opener, and cyber follows. So l focus on the opportunities is sometimes much more convincing, especially for leadership, uh, than focusing uh, on the risks. Um, it's also, I mean, if you look at it at the corporate level, it's also sometimes that, you know, the Department for Digitization gets all the means. The, di the CISO has to ask for money all the time because, uh, <laughs> you know, when everything's fine, uh, he has done his work, but nobody sees it. So, I mean, a little bit it's the same with cyber and digital. Digital is much more comforting for, for leadership, but it's just, you know, the same topic, just looked from the other side, focusing on the opportunities. And um, many, many countries will look at it from this perspective, although the other perspective, the security perspective, cannot be neglected. And if you want to have a sustainable transition, you have to uh, cover, you know, protect also uh, the backside of, of the project. I think this is a again another commonality we are facing actually, and uh, as as I have said that we are suffering from the short of staff in the ministry, and this is also the matter relating to the priority. So we have to uh, uh, deal with this issue of awareness uh, in so you know, and we have to pass with our leaders uh, so that we can have more resources uh, on on cyber security issues. And uh, 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 actually, I mentioned earlier that the uh, World Bank has created a, 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 a cybersecurity trust fund, and uh, they are also struggling uh, this kind of element uh, because in uh, traditionally development agenda is for digital, not for the cybersecurity. Because cybersecurity, you, you 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 cannot see the benefit of cybersecurity unless you got uh, cyber attacks. So this is a kind of you know uh, you know that you have to you have to show it uh, why the uh, cybersecurity is important and I think World Bank is working on that how to there is a, it's very hard to get the statistics to show the effect of cybersecurity efforts or sort of you know, uh, return on 
of their investment on cybersecurity stuff. But uh, they are working on that. And I think maybe uh, if you uh, t uh, approach to the World Bank, may they may have some you know, good statistics to show uh, the importance of cybersecurity investment. So th this is uh, just an information. <laughs> I would I would echo and agree with the comments uh, from my colleagues and and I think a, a useful analogy here is um, it it doesn't matter how many times you tell a child not to touch a hot stove the child has to touch the stove to learn not to do it again <laughs> and um, so I I agree with um, Ambassador Shizuki's point that that uh, cybersecurity is a cost. And, and it's really about avoiding bad things. Um, and rather than learn from our own hard experience, touching the stove, uh, we need to try to learn from others' hard experience. Uh, and so part of our challenge is convincing our leaders that the bad things that we see happening other places could happen to us. Uh, and and that, is, that is a hard argument to make in a busy world where you know, they, they may have 40 priorities, and this is 40, number 41, um, which, which leads really in my mind to uh, Ambas Ambassador uh, Greenberger's point, which is, and, and this has been true for me as well, um, focus, on, focus on the opportunity, focus on the upside, often that's digital, and, and digital can be a, a path uh, to cybersecurity. Hello, my name is Jutta Kiat Matapaniwat. I'm uh, ministry, uh, from Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. First of all, I wish to echo um, Ambassador Ishizuki uh, about the capacity building. I couldn't agree more with the, uh, what, what, what you just say about the capacity building and then uh, regional can be, can be uh, the way forward. Uh, of course, the, uh, I, I, I think on Thailand, we, we work closely with Japan for the ASEAN Japan cyber security capacity building and then we, we look forward to, to do more in our region, and uh, capacity building can also be more more of the global initiative, like what what the uh, Bureau of CDP has been doing for for, for this program, this fellowship. Um, I have one question that 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 may be or may not be uh, echo with other countries, but I think in, in in my country Thailand, when we talk about cybersecurity, most of the people think about cybercrime. They want to do to, to see how we can tackle cybercrime, but they don't really know there is another aspect of uh, security. Let's say internal security, as Ambassador Greenberger had mentioned about uh, how 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 we can, of course, as a diplomat and as a cyber diplomat who working day to day every day with this issue, I know how important it is. But for the uh, other ministry, other government officials, they don't really know how we can less awareness and how we can convince them that this issue merit another you know investment further investment to 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 make us prepare for the cyber attack or other challenges thank you okay let's start with the um, investment part um, there has also be to be a trade-off between uh, domestic investment and investment abroad in, in this field. So uh, that is when I talk with my colleagues about cyber capacity building, I always describe it um, as a two-way street. So you, might, you may be investing in a program uh, that helps law enforcement in other places to, you know, to get up to speed to what cyber criminals, criminal organizations are able to do, and you spend that money abroad. But at the same time, you you get an indirect reward from that activity because this is by nature cross-boundary activities that you are combating here. So. If you are, if your partner is able to reduce the level of activity, it will benefit yourself. So, um, I think that is one trade-off that um, 
you can use in the in your argumentation towards um, other parts of the government. And the second one is, of course, should I uh, go for investment in my own structures as for ministry, for example, or is it uh, is it is the issue better taken care of uh, in other parts of the of of the governments? So. Um, increasing the international competences, for example, of your cybersecurity agency. And uh, in our case, we have decided that all of the players in the, um, in the, in the government architecture or in the whole of, we have a whole of society approach to so all of the actors in this architecture should be able to deal with the international aspect. So we have a cybersecurity strategy, a national cybersecurity strategy that defines one of the action fields is Europe. For us, it's you know the first framework, Europe and international affairs. But it's not um, a list of taskings only for the foreign ministry. It's a list of taskings for all the actors in the field. Uh, I think the uh, uh, maybe. The role of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the government system is to collect the information from abroad, I mean, on the incident cases or threat intelligence or threat awareness. And uh, with that, maybe we can, you know, convince other agencies that you have to, pro you have to, you know, you have to, you, you know, work hard in order to protect yourself from these threats. So uh, information gathering and, you know, this info, uh, dissemination of these informations uh, inside the government is, I think, the, uh, this is one of the rules and one of the things we can do vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, other agencies. And uh, as for the uh, uh, cyber crime, like, uh, I think that nowadays uh, most of the uh, uh, threatening, I, I think the one of the most uh, threatening uh, uh so uh, one of the you know uh, biggest threats in the cyberspace is a ransomware, and uh, for that I think the uh, the uh, U.S. has uh, United States has uh, set up a framework called uh, Quantum Ransom Initiative, and uh, I, I think the uh, nowadays I think there are more than forty countries have already participated in this you know framework, and uh, uh, and uh, I think in in our case the uh, our national police agency is quite active in that framework, and that so. If you can have this kind of you know, international framework where uh, you know, uh, police agencies or law enforcement agencies can participate, uh, that would you know, give them a kind of you know, a, a cause or interest uh, to, to invest more heavily on, on the, on the yeah, cybersecurity side. Thank you. And with that, all good things come to an end. Uh, not only the session this morning, but this fellowship year for our inaugural class of JELIX Fellows. I want to thank um, my friends and colleagues, Regina Hideo, for not only joining us here today, but for your partnership uh, around the world. And I really want to thank our class of fellows for committing your time and energy uh, to each other and to the fellowship. I hope it's been a good year from your perspective. It's been really exciting for us to see the energy uh, in the group. Uh, we look forward to working with you now out in the world, all around the world in the years to come. We're gonna look to you to help us set the tone for the classes that follow. Uh, and I just wanna conclude maybe with a round of applause to thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> we wish you well and we really are in it together. Take care. Thank you for doing this. <laughs>